University of Nottingham, uh, Inggris, uh, dan uh, biasanya beliau dipanggil Ibu Sandy. Ya, yeah? uh, I introduce you and your nickname, yes, Ibu Sandy. <laughs> uh, yang kedua adalah Bapak Profesor Khairul Ada Arahim, beliau dari University Malaysia Sarawak. Jadi uh, bisa bahasa Melayu juga, ya. Yeah? Uh, kemudian ada Pak Dr. Yan Van der Ploeg. Yang duduk di belakang. So, Dr. Ian van der Broek is our colleague, also from the Van Hal Larensen University, Holland. Yeah. Uh, we just uh, make some uh, activity on uh, pitland community in Ketapang area. Uh, he's still there. Okay, yeah. And Pak Ian uh, expert on crocodile. So, maybe it's related to the fresh water. <laughs> Uh, Pak Ian ini ahli buaya, ya tentang buaya buaya. Uh, this one is Pak Hari, Indonesia. <laughs> Pak Hari, that's Pak Ian on the back. Pak Hari, ada Pak Ian, ya. Yeah. Oke, okay. okay. dan hari ini kita akan mendengarkan tentang uh, penelitian terkait di. Uh, air perairan ya freshwater uh, biodiversity jadi nanti akan disampaikan oleh Ibu Sandy dan Pak Hairul uh, nanti Ibu Sandy akan bicara dalam bahasa Inggris nanti ada Kak Sinta yang akan mentranslate atau Pak Marwanto juga silakan terus <laughs> translate dan kalau ada yang bertanya silakan Uh, pertanyaannya dalam bahasa Indonesia kalau bisa bahasa Inggris lebih baik ya siapa tahu nanti diajak ke Inggris kan <laughs> nanti uh, apa akan ditanya juga oleh Ibu Rosita so uh, Ibu Sandy I'm very happy that you are here and thank you for your coming to our uh, campus for giving lecture to our student and Pak Hairul also uh, the first one will be Bu Sandy atau Pak Hairul Pak Hairul oke okay, ya yeah. please Marwanto will be in charge as moderator. Oke, okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi dan salam jumpa. Salam. Oke, okay, uh, this is a uh, first time uh, for me to uh, as a moderator in English. Maybe I uh, <laughs> I say in uh, uh, maybe. Maybe can share. Okay. Uh, so kita sangat beruntung hari ini. We are very lucky. We have uh, two lecture to sharing about her experience in their research. Maybe uh, so you must uh, get more information for your experience too. And uh, the first time in this uh, schedule activity, can sharing from Prof Hyrule. Maybe next the time for you. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Tanya tanya bagi. Oh, itu, oh, di sini. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm a bit sad. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Uh, thank you very much, Bu Farah, as a dean from Faculty of uh, Forestry, and Pak Hairi, as a dean, and all from lecture, and also all my graduate student. Thank you very much for inviting me, sharing my uh, my experience about. Uh, Fresh water fish ecosystem actually. This uh, saya like saya nak berkongsi pengalaman saya kebetulan untuk mahasiswa dan juga dosen about my 30 years experience research on how to manage network. As a aquatic biologist, mostly I'm working on you know, two, uh, three different uh, niche area: fish, such as native fish, ikan tempatan, 
uh, local fish and ikan asing, alien fish. And also I'm working on aquatic invertebrate, most is on crayfish, uh, alien crayfish, so Asia, particularly in Borneo and Indonesia, right, in Java and Sumatra. And also I'm also working on mangrove system. We have been working together a lot with Farah and also with my counterparts in, from Bali, you uh, see Udayana, which are focused on flora and fauna. This is a view at the uh, Danau Sentarum. Uh, I don't know that there's some part of that area they have a crocodile also. Yeah. This, uh, this is my picture, Gabar Saya, since starting in 1994 in Barrio Highland. Uh, saya study ikan bermula daripada ulu sungai, uh, uh, we start with trout. Uh, now the new one in Sungai Tembeling, last, last month, last two months, in Pahang, Peninsula Malaysia in Sarawak Rivers. I'm working in invasive species, that what I mean. This is a uh, macro catfish, very really invasive. This is a hot uh, studies now. I'm also working on it, uh, to how to control, to, to, to identify the impact of the, uh, this invasive species in, on the native eco, uh, organism. This is, uh, I'm working in, on the endangered species, Ikan Tomoleh. They were really found that only three places in the world Peninsula, such as Sungai Pahang, Sungai Perak, and also in Mekong River. So, ya, ini gambar-gambar saya. Saya suka tunjukkan gambar saya. My experience working masih lagi muda. Ini belum kawin, masih bujang waktu tu. <laughs> Until now, I'm still working. This is my hobby, menjala cari ikan. This is new species, bau, mite, semi bagus. We Meaning that saya bekerja, we work on every ecosystem from freshwater to coastal area. And ini juga that's it. Probably I'm still working on it. Uh, this is Mekong, probably Javani, one of the uh, endangered freshwater fish uh, in the world. Uh. Saya akan pergi ke next week. Saya akan pergi ke Pahang di Semanjung, one of the national park in Peninsula for community awareness program how to protect the species. Huh? Uh, this, uh, the, we can, the size can catch about, can get, get, gain weight about 50 kilo. Besar kan? Uh, this is tempat-tempat yang saya pergi. Suka sungai-sungai, Sungai Pahang, Sungai Siak, Riau, Kanwit, Insab, Sarawak, Rompin, we study about microbankum, Budanggala, Limbang, in the black water, Fort Plain, black and brown water, and also Sungai Kampar, Sungai Rajang, and Sungai Sepia. This is in the National Park area. A very interesting uh, place. Habitat. Mana Okay. Oh, okay, sini. Ini, sungai-sungai. This is monster fish. My favorite. Huh? Ikan tapah, walango, uh, toho tambrodes. Uh, this is in Indonesia. In Putusibau. I call them paradise of freshwater fish. Very, we can find that there are many big fish and monster fish in that area from Batang Sungai, what do you call? Uh, it's Sungai Persi. Kapuas. Kapuas. Sorry, but I, I always forget about Kapuas. Since uh, my first talk in Palangkaraya. <laughs> and also, I also like to survey fish and other organisms in uh, rice field, uh, the Sawah Padi. Such in Danau Malinjau, North Sumatra, even in Jatiluwa Bali. Ini kampung saya. Ini Rizmilan. Ini kampung isi saya. Selengo. Semua sama padi. And also this one. Ada semua nama rumah publication about invasive species, pemeka uh, ataupun siput uh, gondam. Yang kami pun kami ini mencari juga sama dengan akan penelitian yang recently di South and Central Kalimantan. This is also, also study the black uh, water habitat. Uh, it's, uh, this is in Riau, West Kalimantan, Tasik, Dam, and then flat plain, this area. Black water and brown water. Juga, saya suka study dalam Gua, Trono. I'm pretty sure that in Indonesia there are many caves that still not Explore. I hope Pak Udin, Pak Harry will invite me one day to explore uh, the fish 
in the uh, in the cave, uh, enjoy it. Uh, some place we must say we not enough fun to study the future. A uh, very basic fun to explore, but uh, and also not too many people would like to work in uh, cave. Juga di danau, sah ini danau Singkara, danau Maninjau, perataan Bali we explore there. Uh, danau Sentarum. Uh, Bukit Terkenang and Bengoh Dam. There are many other places. To show that this is a various habitat. This is Danau Sentaro. Everybody know it. Uh, during the dry and wet season. And also, post, finally we enter the coastal area. Nusa Limbongan in Bali. Teluk Burungi. Uh, Kawang. Uh. Mananya saya travel the upstream to the coastal area. Ini contohnya saya study on mangrove area in that area in Asa Jalau since 1998 until now 2024 I'm still working on it and also finally at the coastal area Batu Ampar Kuburaya with Pahiri Nusa Limbongan Paratikar with Pahiri and the rest of Sofat Mora Sumata and Asa Jalau Asa Jalau and then kalau kita nak study be the uh, field base I can fit, I can see hard physically, mentally when you face Mahadab people bagai cabara. And it's even, Alhamdulillah, masih lagi boleh to 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 explore the nature masuk gua. Then, ini ada sebagian publikasi fish and structure tentang ikan yang telah saya buat untuk pengetahuan sebagai freshwater fish in the upstream, di hulu sungai. Dan juga buku tentang ikan di Malaysia, Freshwater Fish. Dan juga ikan genetik study on tall species, which very high, highly expensive, uh, exotic fish uh, in genetic structure of uh, ikan tumole, ikan kelah. And after we got this fish, just a feature. And also this is I'm um, study on crayfish invasion, uh, market location. Survey. This is a very, a very invasive species. Ikan yang invasive, uh, fish yang invasive yang boleh mengancam terhadap ekosistem uh, habitat air tawar. Saya tak tahu lah sama ada masih lagi didapati di ada atau tidak spesies seperti di Kalimantan. Dia akan memberi ancaman yang besar. Huh? Uh, this is where we got the sample huh? with my PhD student huh? S3 huh? to check. Uh, the population of the fish, uh, this fish, and some of my publication about this uh, species, uh, and also what. Uh, untuk menjadi seorang dosen, we got a lot. Untuk kita bergerak ini juga kita memerlukan fund, uh, biaya, uh, sponsor. So saya bermula dengan short uh, internal research grant, uh, human research grant, and then for the external research grant, dan juga international research grant. Such as National Geographic with uh, the, uh, Dr. Zendi, Zai Foundation, Chemio Biotrop, uh, uh, Bionesia, and European Union. And also, this is some of my publication focus uh, so on conservation, taxonomy, ecology, uh, molecular genetic, dan juga penemuan yang Bila highlight kita menemui satu yang baru, kita mendapat media yang luas. Ini contohnya, yang spesies Cairo Glonca, satu dunia tahu about uh, the fresh water mussel. Berbagai bahasa, Arab, Chinese, Portuguese, Chinese dan uh, berbagai website menceritakan tentang penemuan spesies uh, molas terbaru. Di mana akan lebih detail diterangkan oleh uh, Bu Zani. This is how my, my international working from Europe, North American and Asian, with, together with other uh, members. And also national networking. Kita juga bekerjasama, pengalaman saya bekerjasama dengan pihak-pihak jabatan kerajaan yang berkaitan and with other universities. Huh? And sekarang ini saya dah bagi antara keynotes and better speaker yang telah saya dijemput setakat ini, termasuk juga dalam media, televisyen dan sebagainya. What is effective uh, research networking uh, for the new young lecturer, young docent uh, in the future? Uh, this is a important skill for early 
kerja researcher ha? Gateway pintu untuk mendapatkan kolaborasi bersama ha? Dan caranya antaranya bila kamu sudah keluar nanti uh, Banyak akan pergi conference ha? Communicate your research ha? Build a network And become a member some of the Macam biodiversitas eh, Indonesia ha? Web, uh, Website and publishing journal lah. And then this is some of the my international, international collaboration ha? Prof. Zendi, Dr. Aswar, Dr. Ibu Farah, Pak Sofwan, Pak Heri also to, to together This is my, some of my partially of my research uh, collaboration And bila kita, ah, ini, this is very main point Bila you sebagai seorang mahasiswa, bila ketemu dengan orang kampung, masyarakat Jangan cakap tinggi, ha? you gunakan bahasa yang sesuai ha? Jangan gunakan, oh Pak ini Deserve oxygen concentration is quite high, uh, quite low, the the toxic uh, in that area. So, kita kena explain with, uh, dengan bahasa yang mudah yang dipahami oleh masyarakat kampung. Pak, pak, ini oksigennya tinggi banget, ini suhunya, kimikalnya. Di orang kampung tidak faham, kita explain dengan cara yang mudah dipahami oleh uh, mereka. This is my, I want to share my fresh water exploration since 2015 until now just showing the picture. Because I want to share it, what I've done it since the last uh, 10 years with together with uh, Dr. Zendi. Uh, this is in Sarawak Expedition with my colleagues John uh, Manuel uh, from Tugel, uh, Ronaldo. He uh, said, We meet uh, Penan people, rural community, uh, long, makan malam, uh, not survive, pucho paku. Dalam hutan, dua minggu, mana ni nak survive? Makan pucho paku lah. <laughs> uh, this is a uh, we did in uh, kawasan kalau banyak nyamuk kita pakai ini minimal uh, protect your face uh. Uh, we are very hungry people uh, local people help me uh, invite me in rural area near to the border in Indonesia we have a lot we went to long house and stay some place in that area uh. the first our oh, our first expedition and uh, macam-macam lah tempat kami lah masuk ladang sawi ke sungai upstream, various habitat dan juga aplikasi yang kami dapat ada empat ada ah, tu dalam, dalam tu ada empat aplikasi ah, boleh saya cakap uh, part of the wing chain some of the publication writing by Dr. Zendi and with our team this is the next expedition, Brunei expedition uh, two times uh, with the University of uh, Brunei Darussalam uh, together with uh, my colleagues uh, this one is a uh, Expedition very challenging. Uh, before then, this is habitat, the place where we stay. We stay at the long house here with John. Uh, we found it. Check the water quality. Notes the local environment. Uh, went to other places. This is Dr. Zendi. Very, very challenging. Uh, people help us. Uh. And also, sometimes we got accident. <laughs> so be careful. My, you mean that SOP, standard operation procedure, you should uh, practically alert some condition. And we also take a break for a long journey, about 12 hours drive in the rural logging area, Santai Santai, at very slippy road. Finally, we save at the time. The local people help us a lot. Huh? Yeah. This is Zendi. This is the road. <laughs> and this is where we got the muscle. And finally, and finally, we found the new species, new genus, Kerogloncha longborium and Sanase, after 94, 94 years of uh, discovery of this new muscle. They give it the name, the new genus, Kerogloncha, and this is the distribution. We found it in Limba, this area north, uh, of Sawa and Aba. And this is new, two new genus, and this is the title of Kerogloncha, new species. Uh, and and then we also have an uh, expedition Kalim uh, West Kalimantan expedition with Pahari, Pak Manuel, Bufara also. Because we put Ibu Zani, Pak Harold, Pak Manuel, because we are in here now. It's okay. Yeah. And this is our trip. The first, we start to a uh, towards part of the Tapang area. Huh? Towards of equatorial line. This, uh, we drive about from noon, we found, arrived at area about at night, nine something. Bersama orang kampung This is uh, Sungai Ketapang uh, Sungai Pawan uh, Same thing We found the species And also 
then we have to trip to the Potoshiba uh, uh, in upstream. This one is uh, just this the uh, Simitau area with Paheri during that time. Uh, this, I showed you uh, the study site. And this is, we found that one, uh, just this from 1982, and we reported in 2019 again the species. Uh, and also, this is my, our recent publication. We found what another three new species from three new species from this expedition, expedition two from Indonesia, from West Kalimantan, and one from Malaysia. Uh, just recently published. And this is a new species. Okay, there is Mamawani, Opasanaria, and Residents Laur, where we found this species from the Laur area. And Pingoto, Pautin. Uh, Pak Harry, uh, Pak Harry here. This is my sister, Mawani, and also President Lauri. And this is how we identify the muscle, uh, with some of this, uh, this uh, shape and structure. Uh, from here, we can start sorting it, uh, check it, bersihkan dalamnya, cuci, uh, and this is this is also. With the same team, Bufara, Dr. Manuel, and Dr. John, and also a local proprietor, and from the Brim. And this is our first day of arrival in uh, West Mata. And we will come for Lulu. Macam ni, Tibok ni, tak muat kan? This is John, Manuel. Full with the pack, ah. Only one car for the expedition. But that's, that's the challenge ah, to do your research. This is a uh, jalan went to Pai Kumbo, Minang, uh, Sumatra, very beautiful area. And also some, some real have a crocodile, so big. Uh, <laughs> I'm very exhausted sometimes. Uh, uh, this is an uh, area, it is, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the Sumatra, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is me when I'm working, I enjoy it, last year. Uh, but it's called to the John also, to the Zedi in uh, some of the lakes in North Sumatra. And here in Tasik, Maninjau and big rivers in the Zedi. So we uh, sampling, uh, try to sample the muscle. And so we went to the uh, palm oil plantation, uh, the expression of in Riau, Sumatra, I think people there, uh, is some species that look like the same. I don't know if it's very well in, in, in Peninsula, but they are in uh, Sumatra. And this is uh, where we study about a species distribution of mangrove uh, in Bali Island. Di masa saya sampai, jalan lu gambar cantik kan? Lepas tu, pergi sana, tak boleh sini. And then, let me really hard. What is it called this one? Uh, Seaweed for, for collagen, for cosmetic. Tak tahan saya tengok sini, lala saya mandi juga. Very beautiful fish. Very beautiful. In one island. And we work on mangrove, saya kena berkaya. Mulanya saya seronok berkaya. Finally, you lihat muka saya. Saya. And you see the situation, yeah, enjoy. For example, in mangrove, a maroon wood borer, semilo. Uh, and can you imagine? Tahu tak saya berkaya? See my face, huh? Wah, this one very interesting. Mau nangis, saya sakit pinggang. It's far, because you want to survey, to see the environment, the pollution, and also to find a species, to see the species composition. Uh, in that area, in Mangrove, in Bali, Nusa. And also, uh, finally, we did it. Uh, traveled a lot in Bali, uh, got, uh, in Babai, Bali. This, we, uh, actually, we published uh, several papers, uh, plastic composition of Mangrove, uh, and we found the new record of marine water borer uh, index and the water quality in, in Indonesia. And also, also, working on freshwater giant prawn. I should, this area actually is famous for crocodile. 
That's why I put, they put the net for you to collect the, uh, to collect the fresh water prawn. Huh? Because uh, in also some area, so I have to be, to be careful. You know, to Until now, we still make a good connection with one of the world uh, experts on mangrove. Huh? And then, some of this new publish, uh, uh, a publication to the publish, uh, we, we study the association of this thing about almost three years, four years to complete the, to cover the whole area. Baru aja di Papua India, Tanakan, sama aja saya sama uh, Tabuk Cities, Philippines, West Kalimantan, Bali, some other area. Because from there we can get the source, we can get the more information uh, where the fish monger, fish uh, get a supply of fish from fish. This one the tip of get uh, information. Then this is my our recent expedition uh, with uh, Bozandi, with Paudin from Makaraya. We travel from here to here. Uh, yeah, and then we stay now. This day come from Polis Masyarakat Sentisten juga. Ini lah memberi sokongan saya dua bulan, dua minggu, tiga minggu. Ini support. Okay, terima kasih. Sekian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, the sharing session from Cairo. Very nice. Okay. Maybe I can talk in bahasa first. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Terima kasih. Uh, ini mungkin sedikit uh, pengalamannya, berbagi pengalaman teman-teman sangat bagus. Uh, Di mana kalau saya mencatat uh, catatannya nasihatnya uh, kita harus buat experience. And I get curious about what the most thing, the most interesting things for you that uh, while study about fish and the memories you cannot um, forget until now. That is my question. And thank you very much. That where we can found the species only. Mekong, uh, Pahang, and Perak Rivers in the world, and we have worked together with local community NGOs and uh, others, uh, government bodies, because this uh, this species uh, declined, the population of the species is declined recently. So we need to more people, we make a awareness program that for the people because this migratory fish. So they we during the migration for breeding. We advise local community to make rules and regulation that not allow to them to catch the fish during the breeding season. And now it's take a time. Finally, we success and local people and government take initiation uh, alert about this current situation. Uh, this is the first one. We enjoy it to conservation of uh, rare and endangered species, species fish, uh, that people now the importance of the protect the fish in the, for the future generation. This is one. Number two, that is very amazing that. We found the new muscle, the genus Kerugucai. Uh, the colleague gave me the name after me, after 94 years. That uh, that good worldwide. After discovery, after 94 years discovery, the new genus of the uh, freshwater mussel. Yes. Uh, terkait haya, uh, keberagaman hayati di air tawar, terutama di daerah saya, khususnya Kapuas Hulu, Bapak. Saya izin bercerita singkat. Di Kepuas Ulu itu ada namanya ikan arwana yang menjadi ikan identik di Kepuas Ulu sebagai ikan hias seperti itu Pak. Dan juga ada namanya ikan semah. Nah, pengalaman saya pada saat saya masih kecil dulu ikan semah di, di sungai kami namanya itu sungai Taman Baloh kebetulan di kecamatan Balhulu kampung saya. Di sana itu masih sangat eh, sering ikan semah. sering kita temui. Tapi pada saat sekarang, ikan semah tersebut sangat susah sekali untuk kita temukan. Yang saya ketahui dulu mungkin yang menjadi kenapa sekarang kurang ditemukan mungkin dari perubahan iklim dan segala macam. Dan juga adanya e, jual beli ikan tersebut yang mungkin mengurangi e, jumlah ikan di sana. Dan juga ada juga yang namanya ini ikan, kalau bahasa daerahnya itu pet batu. Ini dia kecil tapi itu sangat enak. Uh, ini menjadi uh, kekhawatiran saya, takutnya nanti beberapa puluh tahun ke depan, belasan tahun ke depan, ikan pet batu yang pada saat ini sering kita temui nanti berimbas sama seperti ikan uh, ikan semah tadi, Pak. Uh, jadi bagaimana saran Bapak sebagai peneliti uh, kepada kami, calon sarjana yang nantinya akan terjun ke masyarakat, 
seperti apa langkah-langkah yang patut kami lakukan untuk menjaga kekurangan spesies to atau semah dan arowana as itu disebabkan ada dua faktor they have two factor uh, tangkapan yang berlebihan for the market price is very high very expensive they export illegally or sometimes they sell it the semah to Malaysia but for the smuggle the muscle of product Kedai ini menyebabkan populasi itu berkurangan Ialah harganya makin mahal Tapi dia uh, Kalau tak silap untuk kawal ikan Arwana ni dia menggunakan chips uh, Untuk kawal Tapi ada juga yang smuggle kan Susah kan jual harga yang mahal Dan juga perubahan alam kita Deterioration of water quality due to the uh, Agriculture activities in tak, Pertanian uh, Baja, racun semua itu mengalir ke sungai Menyebabkan populasi yang berkurangan dan salah satu antara langkah yang terbaik untuk meningkatkan to preserve the area, mungkin penglibatan komuniti penduduk kampung protect that area, like a tagal system, you know what tagal system? tagal tagal itu, kawasan itu dikonversi macam di Sumatera satu kawasan itu dikonversi di, 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 di gazetkan huh? that only not not allow, tidak dibenarkan menangkap mengeksportasi sumber ikan dan diketua oleh ketua kampung bersama masyarakat uh, seperti yang banyak dibuat di Sarawak dan di Sumatera uh, uh, di mana ikan itu tetap terus hidup di sungai itu supaya terus terpelihara tidak boleh ditangkap sebarangan sekiranya ada tangkapan ilegal dilakukan masyarakat akan menghukum jadi sumber itu akan sentiasa terpelihara dan mungkin juga kita boleh gazetkan memberitahu melalui ketua kampung atau masyarakat bahawa please don't destroy, jangan musnahkan kuasa ini agar sumber-sumber uh, perikanan terus terpelihara. Tapi tagal is the best system lah uh, untuk pengawalan sumber secara berterusan. Sekian, terima kasih. Boleh? Anyone have question to you? What's more, maybe? Okay. Okay, uh, maybe... Uh, Uh, the next session, second session is Eric. Expedition, as Carol already mentioned, to uh, the Kapuas, Upper Kapuas Basin. Um, so you can see the hurry up there. And I just wanted to put this on early on in the talk uh, to emphasize on the importance of our collaborations and all the different people that are involved in, in this work. Um, <coughs> so in this case, uh, I've As Carol said, we have been working together for a long time, about 10 years now. Uh, it started when I when I moved to Malaysia in 2014-15. Um, I'm now living in the UK, but I spent four years in Malaysia. So I, I think one of my children was born there. Um, and so what 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 I bring is the you know the, the scientific training, I guess, and the ability. To, to publish and to write up papers so I'm, I'm trying to give that to the project I can also maybe uh, get higher funds uh, more more funding from western organizations and partly also from my university directly uh, but obviously I'm just like a, a small part in this whole project that has been going on for so long every single person here is really important so Cairo is always extremely well connected, he's such a, a lovely person, everybody likes to work with him, it's just always fun with him in the field, uh, he's really good with people and so yeah, so not only with, with other academics uh, across the region but also with local people, So, which is really important for our work. Uh, so local people have incredible knowledge about the biodiversity um, here, so what we are actually doing now in, in our survey work is First, we're trying to find the right people to talk to. Uh, in this case, it was a family who actually helped us uh, finding the mussels. So they actually went with us in the river, and they are much better than us in the local river to find them. They know exactly where they are. Um, and, and Manuel, he's from Portugal. He's uh, often coming with us, not this time. Um, he is very well. So he's. Uh, the coordinator for Freshwater Bibles of the ICN, uh, a species specialist group. So that's an important role he has, but he also has a lot of access to funding for genetic sequencing, which is also handy for us. And 
he's very uh, yeah, he, he sits in a really nice group there in Portugal at, at CBO. And of course, the local collaborators are incredibly important. So Pakari, in this case, he accompanied us and he organized everything for us for the for the couples. Yeah. Um, so this is how we work and have been working. I think really symbiotically, uh, in a sense, with each other. There are still some things that I would like to work better, um, it, but this is more in terms of outputs and in terms of the impact that our research has. Uh, this where we are, we're still struggling. So my, um, my overall aim of my work is really to um, contribute scientific knowledge that can help us to protect and uh, conserve biodiversity, freshwater biodiversity in this region. Um, and this is not easy, obviously. I mean, you, what we know now of mussels, we know pretty well in some region at least where they are, what are the endangered species, what are the rare species, we know pretty much what we should do in terms of uh, mitigating threats and so on, but then to convey that and to make that change happen, that's a really, really tricky part. Uh, so obviously my role cannot be very big in that sense because I'm not from here. <coughs> uh, I try to do that a little bit now with the, through the ICN, through the international organizations. Um, yeah, but so that's why I'm so glad I see so many young motivated students here know you're from forestry. Um, but if, what you're doing to the forest highly impacts the fresh water, so I'm quite happy whatever you do there. And yeah, so this is the big issue, I think, is that there's just not enough people working on this in, 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 in the countries. Um, <coughs> but yeah, so again, just to illustrate, like, uh, because we're working across Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, and all this whole region of Sunderland. This is maybe like the most important collaborators at the moment, but there are many more. So my papers always have many, many different co-authors and every single one is really important, yeah. Um, yeah, just to give a quick background about my, my journey. So I'm, I'm Austrian, it's like a small country in, in Europe. Um, um, yeah, so I, I did my first degree in Vienna, that's our capital city, and I then went to the UK to do my PhD there at Cambridge uh, that was on general uh, freshwater mussels. So I was interested in freshwater mollusks through my, my master thesis, and I tried to uh, just find a um, PhD somewhere, and I ended up in Cambridge. It was uh, quite lucky and really nice. Um, but this was on, on European species, and I was really, at that point, I, I realized there's so much money going into conservation of freshwater mussels in Europe, really millions and millions of euros for this big life project, because we have this one species called freshwater pearl mussel that everybody really loves for some reason. Um, but then I realized there's so many areas outside Europe and, and North America where we don't know anything. We don't even know what species there are. Nobody has looked at these things for how, like 100 years or something like that. So, um, and it just seems really strange. So I, I deliberately tried to get uh, positions uh, or work with um, universities anywhere else than Europe or the US. Um, I then ended up for half a year at Passat Saad University in Thailand which was really hard because nobody could speak English and I can speak Thai. <laughs> um, then I had my first child in, in the UK, so I did some postdocs around Europe, um, and, and then I got this position uh, at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. So that was a three-year fellowship, and then I worked an additional year as an assistant professor. Then I got my uh, permanent position in the UK campus, um, but I still come here every year. And Carol and I were, uh, for example, uh, co um, supervising a PhD student now, so this is a really, we, because we have that foundation, I think it, it still goes on really well. Yeah. Um, so I work generally on freshwater biodiversity, but my uh, taxonomic expertise is mostly on, on mussels, and just because nobody else is working on that, I, I, I might as well uh, just do that. I also do a lot of molecular work. Um, this is just uh, a great tool if you don't know much about your biodiversity, just 
to identify, just to delineate where species end and where the other one starts, so just by figuring out what the species is. Uh, because morphology, the way the lo uh, a specimen looks, is very deceiving. So it's not always, often not very easy to know um, whether it's actually different species or the same species, uh, especially for our muscles. Uh, I also work on um, phylogenetics, which is also important, uh, also for species delineation, but also to know how distinct species are from each other. Uh, so uh, there's one on paper, we'll get back to that point. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're also using now environmental DNA or eDNA. I don't know if anybody has heard of that already, which is a, yeah, theoretically a really nice quick tool to monitor biodiversity quickly. Uh, but we have, there are also many problems with that. Um, so I have two PhD students currently using eDNA um, with all the struggles that come with it. Um, yeah, so one big issue, I think, is that most of these um, protocols for eDNA have been developed for temperate systems, and they don't really work for tropical rivers that are very turbid, and, and, and so on and so on. Um, yeah. So that's generally my, my five, I think, most important fields of research. Oh, yes, yeah, so I also work on ecosystem functions and services. Uh, which basically, you know, the roles the species play in an ecosystem or how they are used, how important they are to humans. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is mainly because I want to have a good <laughs> argument why we should protect muscles. It's a bit stupid because we should actually protect everything for its own sake. And it seems to me also strange to play one species against another or one taxonomic group against the other. Uh, but yeah, I'm a bit guilty of playing that game. Um, just because if you show people a muscle, it's like a brown thing that looks like a stone, and then, well, why, <laughs> why should we care, right? Um, so we're trying our best in a sense. This was really successful in the US. Um, here, I think you have, a, it's even harder because you just have such charismatic mega mammal fauna hard to compete against. But I think generally that's a problem for freshwater conservation, that we don't see them, we see fish as poop and, and nothing else really. Okay, so uh, mussels, so this is, yeah, the, I will focus on, on, on these animals in my talk. There are about 900 species worldwide. They can be found in all sorts of freshwater habitats. Uh, they are highly endangered, so most of the species are quite sensitive to water quality degradation and general habitat degradation. In, the no in North America, where we have really good data, about 10% of the species are already extinct <coughs> because of all the changes we are we're doing to the freshwater habitat. Uh, also, partly because I think over-harvesting. Um, they are really good indicator organisms, which gives a, another good argument why we should um, put money and effort and time effort into uh, looking at these animals. So wherever you find good muscle populations, that means high species diversity and high abundance, this is where you also will find good uh, uh, other macroinvertebrate biodiversity and, and diversity. And they're very poorly studied in the tropics, as you can imagine. <laughs> so I work uh, in this biodiversity hotspot for Sunderland. You are right in the middle here. Uh, you probably have seen these papers before, um, but uh, there are now 36 or 37 uh, global biodiversity hotspots identified. So what makes the biodiversity hotspot a biodiversity hotspot is that it has very high numbers of endemic species and it has very high rates of habitat degradation. <laughs> so here in Southeast Asia, you have several biodiversity hotspots. So uh, this is Sunderland, then next to it you have Wallacea on the right, and it's in the Burma up here, and then the Philippines is a separate one as well. So we're in a really extremely important area for biodiversity conservation. <coughs> Most, as a, uh, first, when, when these biodiversity hotspots were initially delineated in this first paper, I think, to, to, uh, 2011. Um, 
they've based it completely on terrestrial biodiversity. Now there's a little bit of fish data, uh, but the, the data is, is really poor generally for fresh water. So it doesn't mean that this biodiversity is more like terrestrial based biodiversity hotspots are also the same for fresh water, but this is what, what we have to work with. But, uh, yeah, that, that's another, um, another point. Um, yes, yeah, so as freshwater ecologists also in this area, it's really important that you bear this in mind. So this shows you um, the land area and the, what we think these river basins might have looked like during the last uh, glacial maximum. So all of these islands were connected with each other at one point, not actually not very distant past. <laughs> and over you know, millions of years past, this these connections have changed repeatedly. So sometimes, you know, this part of Borneo was connected with Sumatra, and then this part of Borneo was connected with, with Java, and then you had this huge river basin, this paleo basin at one point. We don't really know exactly, like this is just reconstructed from bathymetric maps, so from, from depth maps, but obviously this all changed uh, to other reasons as well. Uh, but it, it is important to bear in mind that uh, we had this large river basin connecting in it's a bit outdated now, but uh, just to illustrate, this is the curve for freshwater, and this is these are the curves for uh, terrestrial and marine systems. This uh, the index is basically a, a measure of how well populations are doing, uh, how whether they they are declining or not, <coughs> and the rate of species loss. Uh, population loss is about five times faster in freshwater habitats. Because habit. we have just so many species living on an area in freshwater habitats, but additionally, because we use freshwater for so many things, and it's impacted in also a, in the basin. Um, here's a, just one, one graph from, from a paper. It's not for tropical rivers. There's nothing like that for tropical rivers. Somebody should do that. Um, but it's, it just illustrates how, where the different threats are acting on freshwater habitats. Some of them directly, like pollution, if you put obviously toxins or uh, pollutants into a river that acts directly and only on the river. Um, but if you are change, if you are cutting off the primary forest close to a river or even just in the wider basin area, and replacing it with aquacultural monocultures, then this leads to sedimentation and pollution and um, all sorts of things. So it's really, that makes it really difficult to protect freshwater habitats, especially rivers, especially lowland rivers, uh, because theoretically you need to protect all the land around it, which is obviously impossible. <coughs> So that's a big challenge. I, I don't know the answer. I just hope that we find the best way of obviously using the resources we need to use, but also uh, minimizing the impact we have. Um, so when I started working in Sundaland, I initially worked in Peninsula Malaysia for a year. So I traveled the, the region and then I started first time I came to Borneo was, I think, Sabah. And both of these regions, you have like, so much palm plantation. So I, I was just amazed. You can go for many hours and all you see is palm oil on, on both sides. Um, obviously, they started, the deforestation started already in the 60s. Um, so this is just an example for Borneo. Um, first, um, just logging and then was trans trans first to um, first rubber and I think then mainly palm oil, was the British actually who, who, who put that there. <coughs> and as I mentioned, so the first thing that happens if you're cutting off the primary forest is uh, you lose this um, root structure that's trapping the sediment, uh, especially which is especially important in tropical systems because of this heavy rainfall, periodic rainfall. And uh, this is a river where we asked the local people there, and they told us looks like this since uh, like only a few years um, because of illegal logging upstream. So it used to be quite clear, 
They used to have lots of prawns and fish and, and also mussels there, but since the illegal logging started, it's just, it's really viscous water. It's full of sediment. It's impossible. Uh, they can't find, nothing lives there anymore. Um, this is actually also a slide from one of my lectures that I'm giving to UK students. Um, it's just to, yeah, so you will know all of this. Uh, the important point that I'm trying to make is, so because Palmer has a really bad reputation in Europe, uh, because it's destructive, obviously, for the forest, but on the other hand, so people trying to avoid palm oil products, but what is not really obvious to everybody is that most of it or a lot of it we're actually using for biodiesel. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that it's a really efficient crop. You will know much better than, than I do about that. But so what is the alternative, right? So it's actually, if we don't use power, we need to use other oil, which takes a lot more area. So I, I, I wasn't aware of that, and I think a lot of people in Europe or in the US are not aware of that. So, uh, and obviously it creates jobs and everything. So we need to, it, it will continue and, and the countries need it. Uh, but for freshwater uh, systems, what has been shown is that actually uh, good enough, wide enough riparian buffers work really well in, in protecting uh, the river systems. And I must say, Karul, I think that's your uh, observation as well. Indonesia is usually doing much better than Malaysia. <laughs> so in Malaysia, many rivers are... Ch and actually, the, I think the legislation is also, it's much smaller, the buffer strips that are required uh, than in Indonesia. And uh, well, yeah, we were amazed when we went to Katapang and you actually have a really good buffer zone there and, and full of mussels, the, the river. Um, not everywhere, obviously, uh, but yeah, I, I think... Well, from my experience, Indonesia is, is, not, is not doing too badly in comparison to Malaysia there. Um, other big threat I saw, especially in Java, is pollution. Um, so I went around with, in, in Java with, with uh, a collaborator from Brin, and uh, one of these streams was completely black. It's not black water, it's because there's like a dye factory, a garment factory upstream. And we talked with the person here, so this tributary is going into a bigger river and they're catching mussels just down there. So obviously it's not very healthy for the people as well. Um, yeah, so this is just one uh, uh, a, a really striking image to me from a, a British newspaper about the Chitarum River and how people basically use, live around that river, like a river uh, as scavengers. Um, and the, again, the interesting thing that I've tried to convey to my students is that a lot of that is because of us uh, in Europe and in the US. Um, we're actually shipping waste into Malaysia and in Indonesia, and UK is doing actually worse than the whole of the, like the European Union at least now has, has, has stricter guidelines. At, at one point, I think Malaysia just sent the rubbish back to us. Uh, this is not talked about much. So usually when we see, we just talk about what the tropical countries are doing, <laughs> but not how, how it's, it's our fault. Um, yeah, so we are, we are sorting the plastics maybe better than Indonesians do, but in the end we're just shipping everything out anyway. Uh, sand and sediment extraction I found. So this is a picture from, from Java as well. I didn't see that so much in Malaysia, I think, but also I think in the Pahang uh, it is used. I don't know how common it is around here. Um, gold mining was super common in our trip now in central Kalimantan. Uh, the Kahayan River, I think they have hundreds of, of, of gold mines uh, on the river. Um, they um, use mercury, so it's highly toxic. Um, and Many people have told us as, as soon as this mercury or gold mining started in the river, they lost basically their the biodiversity. And coal mining, we also saw a lot around Timpa area. Um, I've never been to, um, what is it, north east Kalimantan, where I think Mahakam River is probably the worst, right? You will know better than, than me. Um, but this was the first time we really saw trucks of coal going up and down. 
in central Kalimantan. Um, yeah. And we, we, we had many stories from local people about the issues that actually then workers come uh, to the kampungs, or to the desas, and uh, create more issues, uh, illegal fishing as well, with toxins and, and so on. So, a um, lot going on. So, there are all these threats. I, also, I didn't actually mention dams uh, and, and, and many other issues. Uh, so, despite all these threats, and maybe because of these threats, it makes just conservation in freshwater uh, so difficult, but it's also not a priority. Generally, globally, also in the Western world, conservation literature is really biased towards terrestrial organisms. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's so, so difficult. It, it requires implementation of measurements across very large spatial extent at different scales. Um, and most of the um, protected areas are also focused on terrestrial systems, uh, probably worldwide, but especially, I think, in, in Southeast Asia and in, in, in Sunderland. So, for example, the two largest national parks in Peninsular Malaysia, Belum and Tamanagara National Park, <coughs> uh, are both very famous, but they were designed really just to protect terrestrial biodiversity. So in this area here, in this GIS layer, you can see the river is actually actively excluded from the protected area. And that's also because actually there are two big dams in both of these forests, uh, in, in both of these national parks. <coughs> Fish, we really should know. <laughs> so, yeah, not enough data that they could confidently say what the species richness is. Yeah, it's just not enough people working here. Um, yeah, for for such an important region, it's obviously difficult as well um, because just going, getting around for field work is is hard and it, it costs. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so this is this is. Well, it was 2008, but I don't think, I mean, I think it was Kotelat, I guess, Boris Kotelat, who, who worked a lot on fish uh, before, but, uh, yeah, not many people. Um, and so to get that data, first of all, we need to know what is the species, and often it's, as I mentioned, it's not that easy just to look at a specimen and you, who knows what a species is and what it is, right? So you need taxonomists, or you need at least tools to be to do that. Taxonomists, there are not many left. Um, and for me, I'm the only person who really works at freshwater masters in that whole area. Obviously now with a, a lot of collaborators, but there's no Malaysian or Indonesian who is really focused on that. Um, in Europe, we have hundreds of people working in a small area on, a small proportion of species that you have here. And we know everything already anyway. So one tool that we can use, as I mentioned, that's really important is molecular data. <coughs> it's just basically much more reliable um, to, and, and, and quick, if you know how to do it. Um, to, to deal with these issues of phenotypic plasticity and convergence, morphological convergence. So what I mean by that, phenotypic plasticity means the same species can look very, can come in very different shapes and morphologies just because it lives in different types of habitats. So the same species in a river might grow really long and in a, in a lake might be, look really wide and, and round. <clears throat> That's just because mussels can't really move much, so they just have to deal with whatever, um, wherever they end up. And so in the, in the past, in Europe, the early taxonomists, we have a few species that have been given a hundred names, because all these taxonomists described it as a new species, a new form. So this is an issue, and then on the other hand, the different species can look quite similar as well, <clears throat> because of convergence. So they, they, they both grow in a shape that is good for that type of habitat, and so they, you might actually think they're the same species. But if you look at the genetics, you see they're very distinct from each other. So without that, I don't know how, how I would do my work. It's impossible. So now what we're doing... Um, oh yeah, so the other thing I wanted to show, talk about earlier, is that they are using fish for the dispersal, and that's why they also they, they live on the fish for a few weeks, 
Uh, they need this to disperse because otherwise in a river they would, these larvae would always be swept downstream, so they would always end up in the sea, <coughs> whereas fish can also move upstream. And the mussels themselves, they can't really walk in the, in the sediment, not, not much. Um, so they, they are on the fish and at one point when they're ready, when they're fully metamorphosed, they, they just drop off. So they can drop off at any sorts of habitat, they don't know. Where, what the habitat looks like. So that's why it's good for them to can adjust to different shapes uh, to make that suitable. Um, and that's why, so this, this creates a problem for taxonomy or identification. <coughs> so what, 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 how I started my first project and what we're actually basically doing now as well when I go to a new area and I plan this, this project for a region, I look, first of all, I look at historical records we have very few of these, but for mussels we have this really nice website from a, an American project where they went to all these large collections, museum collections, and um, photographed all these specimens. So most, most of the specimens uh, from, from these regions. Um, so I have this really nice resource, but the data is really... There's not much data, and usually they give really helpful names such as Borneo or Sarawak, so I know somewhere in that region it is, but that doesn't really help me decide where I should look for them, right? Um, but anyway, so I tried to get all the data online, and there are several different sources, so if you work on a different taxonomic group, GBIF is, is a, I think, a very important one, you can write to museums, um, and just try what you find online, basically. If there's S F. Um, so you can always use the specimens for genetic identification as well. Yeah, and then if we, depending on what the results are from the, from the molecular analysis, we then need to maybe do species description, need to make nice uh, photographs that's then up to the locals and Peru to, to do, which is more, more difficult than I imagine. Yeah, Carol just explained to me like what five photos, like one or two specimens is two days of work. So yeah, amazing. And then we have this data basically. We know all the locations where we find which species and where we don't find them, and you can use this for all sorts of, of, of things. And especially if you have environmental data, often we're using um, GIS layers as well, uh, available secondary data layers for modeling of species distributions and so on. Okay, so some results. My first paper was on Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, so I just lived there and I just went around with my Maivi, with a student. Uh, don't know, 150 sites. Uh, the main thing that we found was that uh, species was, the species that were there, they were quite a few differences to what we thought based on, on the museum specimens, but also it has changed quite a bit. Uh, especially three species, two or three, no, three species became much rarer than they used to be before like in the 70s. And, and there is one non-native species where we had one record before 1970 and now it, it's the most abundant and common species that we find everywhere. It's called um, it used to be called Sinanodonta Vudiana, it's now Sinanodonta Pacifica, uh, and, and in um, Indonesia you call it Kiching Taiwan. Yeah. Um, then we went to Borneo, and this was the historical data that we have that I could more or less put on the map. So it's anything that's not, it's a little bit more precise than Borneo or Sarawak, so I could actually put. put and this is just the colors just indicate the, the genus, not the species. Um, yeah, so we started with northern Borneo and Brunei, so which was just easier for me in terms of permits, uh, working in Malaysia. Again, here, all of Sabah, we went there like three weeks, I think, and almost only could find this one non-native species. And then finally, in this really small pocket of National Park, we found two endemic Bornean species, and one of them is this new genus, and the other one is, is, is Shepmena, which we have not found anywhere else yet. I think it should be around here as well, but we haven't been here yet. Uh, the only native Bornean species that's quite common is Rectidens sumatrensis, which we also find in Peninsula Malaysia and Sumatra. 
Um, all the others are really struggling. So this species we know from a single specimen, this one we know of three specimens, all one side. So they're both not, we assess them as critically endangered. Um, yeah, so they, they were changed to Carulocon here, to this new genus name, because what you have to do is, uh, you have to compare the, this, these sequences to a specimen from the type locality. So the type locality is where the species was first described, from where the, it was first described. And so Crenodesma borneensis, this type locality is here. So we had a snip from our, our expedition there, uh, and that's where we found out. Oh, this is something completely different. This is a different genus, definitely a different species, and, um, but you need really the type locality specimen for that. Um, yes, yeah, so this was our publication. Karul already talked about this, so we got quite a lot of interest from the media. Um, and I was hoping, you know, this would help us to, act, to move a little bit forward in terms of conservation, but Karul tried with his university and it just, it, it was just really happy about all, all this publicity, but then they did not do anything further either, so. I'm not trying with IUCN um, funding to, to move forward there. And then that was this Western Borneo paper, where, which we combined with records from Sarawak. And this just should show you how amazing the Kapoor's Basin is. For me, in my opinion, it's the most important uh, river basin for biodiversity, freshwater biodiversity, by far. Yeah. So we have spent, I don't know, maybe like a week or something like that up there. But there should be yeah. many, many projects up there, many students. Um, and only up here, basically, we, we, didn't, we didn't drive up here, we just flew up here. And these are our few sites, but uh, in the, in the um, what is, uh, the Basin. But yeah, so there should be a lot, lot more work here. Yeah. It's really, really important area. And it's so important because I, I mentioned this importance of phylogeny, and so these red species are the Bornean species, and you can see, uh, so the closer the species are on the tree, the more genetically similar they are, right? So that's why sometimes, so in some of these clades, they have the same genus name, right? Uh, and, that, and then on a higher level, you group them by, like this is the subfamily level, for example. And then you have these two species here, Caudicolatus and Discomaya, that are completely unrelated with anything else in Borneo. The closest ones here, um, where are they from? North American, European, that's the closest relatives. Um, here they are, this is Chinese, like, um, Thailand and South, uh, mainland South, Southeast Asia. And so they never diversified. They're really old and they're completely distinct to anything else. So extremely important to protect this, this species. And the only place we found them was in the Seburang River. Yep. So yeah, very, very important. I just applied for a grant to do more work on, on just these two species because the IUCN is really interested in, in this type of work. Um, this is what they look like. If you ever see them, yeah, let us know. So this Kumaya is really distinct. So you can, it's very heavy, thick shell, both of them actually, Caudicolatus as well. Um, this one was supposed to be here. And we tried, but then we had so much rainfall that we couldn't really go up to the stream there. Uh, but I presume both of them are very quite... This Kumaya thing is more common, but Caudicolatus, I think, is quite rare. Okay, and then just one final slide on other work that we're doing. So I told you about the environmental DNA, so if anybody would like to talk about that, let me know. Um, I also have a student that we're co-supervising, which is, which is combining eDNA to monitor muscles and to look at the ecosystem functions and services of muscles. They're really good biofilters. That's something that we're looking into, how, how the, the function um, differs from the function they have in, in temperate systems. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we do we use this data, the distribution data combined with remote sensing data to model species distribution across uh, across the whole of Sunderland, where we looked at different scenarios for how oil palm plantation changed and how climate change is affecting the distribution of invasive and native species. Um, we do conservation assessments, so we published this handbook and national red list for Malaysia uh, a few years back, um, and this is something also that I'm trying to do more. So if you want to talk about conservation assessments and working with the IUCN, there's like online courses that you can do for free to get a properly certified um, ICN red list. And then with also Ibo Faro was involved in our traditional local ecological knowledge uh, project that um, yeah, we are getting more and more interested in, but we, we don't really know how to do it because we're not social scientists. But um, so we're trying to do this properly. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so thank you. So this is again a, a picture from the Sebroang Basin. Any questions? And yeah, so my email is alexandra.sirit, so if you um, want to, you can contact me about anything. So I'm really happy to, and I'm so happy that so many students are here. And yeah, thanks for, for your work and interest. It is a big challenge for us to protect area in fresh water. Maybe uh, like land can uh, like land change, like from uh, illegal logging or deforestation, and then agriculture, and then it's change uh, the fresh water population uh, about uh, sand sediment extraction and gold mining, or we use uh, mercury and then coal mining. This uh, there's no and. Uh, Maybe it is interesting, but um, the, there is not uh, enough data in many other uh, local in, in Java and Sumatra. This is good information for us to maybe to elaborate any research about it. Maybe uh, di sini uh, I can talk in Indonesia first. Okay, okay. Uh, ada yang sudah menjelaskan bahwa memang tadi Kalimantan Barat uh, tepat berdua dan tadi beliau sudah menyampaikan bahwa kita kalau dari cerita dari awal memang baik sekali ya, panjang sekali bahwa kita itu masuk uh, Sumatera Jawa dan Kalimantan setelah balik masuk ke, ke apa dipengaruhi oleh penua Asia sementara yang Papua dipengaruhi oleh uh, Australia tadi di awal ini 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 nembak karena dari tadi saya nggak mengingat, mengingat dari awal semuanya jadi karena ditembak Pak Marwanto oke okay, tapi uh, apa namanya penelitian mengenai masa-masa itu kedungkang kalau orang di hulu bilang apa kerang-kerangan tapi yang first water yang air tawar ya ingat nggak? Kan masih kecil masih ingat teman-teman semua masih bisa di sini. Nah di sini apa namanya dari penelitian e, Ibu Lek Sandra ini apa namanya uh, sudah banyak menemukan hal-hal yang baru. Dan tapi tadi apa namanya bahwa bahwa apa namanya kita memiliki hotspot yang sangat tinggi tapi ada beberapa kendala di sini. Di antaranya datanya tidak ada. Kemudian kekurangan tenaga ahli, ya ekspertise nggak ada belum ada ekspertise. Ya, saya juga itu kebetulan ada nama saya dengan Pak Sofwan dengan Bu Faradiba karena memang diperlukan untuk numpang-numpang seperti itu. Tapi sedikit-sedikit tahu, ya. Tapi itu tadi mungkin diantara teman-teman nanti ada yang memang mau mempelajari mengenai tadi masalahnya mengenai kedungkang mengenai kerang-kerangan air tawar itu sangat terbuka sekali. Ya, jadi masih banyak kawasan dulu tadi Ibu. Ziri sudah menyampaikan bahwa penelitian baru dilaksanakan kalau di Kalimantan Barat itu di Sungai Lahur dengan di Hulu Sungai Kapuas. Saya belum cukup Kapuas juga belum semuanya. Baru seberuang kemudian daerah Semitau Taman Baloh belum tadi dari Taman Baloh ya Taman Baloh ke Hulu belum ada. Ya Se Sungai apa, apa, apa namanya Sungai Sibo mendalam sampai ke Hulu Kapuas Sungai Bungan Sungai itu belum ya itu menarik sekali. Jadi kalau memang ada dari teman-teman nanti akan melakukan penelitian mengenai kedukang, tadi sudah disampaikan bisa ada menghubungi dengan Bu Zirit, ada ada alamat email yang bisa dihubungi. Ya, jadi sangat terbuka sekali. Kemudian tadi ada yang memang natif dan non natif, artinya ada yang terbawa dari dari daerah lain, ya datang ke Indonesia, datang ke Kalimantan, tadi dibawa oleh ikan katanya, diantaranya ya karena si apa namanya si telurnya itu nempel ke badan ikan ada yang keinsang segala macam kemudian di bawah hulu dan mereka berkembang di, di, di apa di hulu seperti itu. Nah jadi ada ada yang asli dan ada yang tidak asli. Kita kadang-kadang malah nggak tahu ini asli apa enggak pokoknya kerang kerang aja kedungkang kedungkang aja gitu ya. Izin kata orang Sunda kalau bisa dibilang. 
mungkin itu nanti jadi terbuka kemungkinan penelitian yang memang sangat sangat apa peluangnya sangat besar untuk dilakukan penelitian di Kalimantan Barat hanya memang kalau apa namanya orang Kalimantan memang uh, orang lokal itu memang bisa melakukan penelitian dengan mudah tapi kalau untuk dari luar rada-rada sulit sekarang penelitiannya ada aturan baru ya yeah. ya yeah, mungkin itu yang bisa sampaikan Thank you, Mr. Hari, to help me to turn... Thank you very much for the opportunity. So let me introduce myself again. So I'm my name is Imelda Hafiza. I'm the third year um, Forestry Faculty Tanjung Pura University student. Um, so I have two question. You has explained so many things about your experience and your um, research. Um, so from your research and your from your experience have you ever found uh, the same species from Indonesia and Malaysia but that same species are shows the dif a different maybe like habits or the other you mean habits how they behave but it's the same species yeah no I don't no. we're not even looking at, at that to be honest um, in, in that much detail uh, yes so there are some species that, I mean uh, the animals don't care yeah. about country borders right so <laughs> they care about the river basins that's more important thing uh, but yes so there are species that are um, distributed across so for example in Borneo um, pseudodon what we call Valpole we found in Sarawak and then in the Kapua Basin as well. So that's interesting. Some species, they manage to cross somehow, or that's maybe because, you know, the dispersal barrier was not there at the time that they um, got, became distributed. Uh, and others, they, like, you know, Desma species, they seem to be less widely distributed. So they're really confined to smaller river basins. As I mentioned in my talk, I think that's because they just use different types of host fish on which they attach uh, as the larvae. So if you have a fish that can travel very long distances, you will be more widely distributed, right? Uh, yes, but in terms of behavior, uh, we are, I mean, it's just us working on these things. We're just trying to figure out what species there are. Um, now I'm trying to do a little bit on ecosystem functions because I have a good reason for doing that because I want to show their importance so that I have an argument for the importance of protecting them, as I mentioned. <coughs> in Europe we know stuff about their behavior, in the US we do. Yeah, nobody is, is working on that, yeah. So, and I think the other thing I would say, so first of all, country border does not matter for, for animals or for any biodiversity, and the other thing is that, um, that I, I wouldn't expect that a, a difference in their behavior, but I also know the cross river basins, but maybe there is some, you know, slight differences in habitat requirements. I would think that would be then based because of genetics. You have, you know, these different genetic populations that are mm, within a species, but they're still different from each other, and that might lead to slight differences in the ecology, maybe. Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting question, but like far, far, far in the future. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you very much for the answer, my curiosity, because during you explain your research and your experience, I was curious about that things. Uh, so my second question, um, what the difference of the selfies to close to the sea and the selfies um, in the up upstairs? Yeah, so... Um, these freshwater bivalves, it's the order Unionida, they, are, they cannot survive in brackish water at all. So there's just, uh, you know, the most recent common ancestor, and so ev everything else, they, what they evolved was these, uh, using fish as their host, um, and that's how they came around that problem of living in the river as a bivalve, which bivalves usually have planktonic larvae, so in the river, the larvae, they cannot swim upstream against the current, right? So what happens if you're reproducing and you're releasing the larvae into the water, they will always be washed with the current. In the sea, in the brackish water, in an estuary, that doesn't matter because it's kind of circulating. Uh, but in a river, it's just one way, and that, that is into the sea, which is where you don't want to end up. So they evolved 
somehow that they can have these larvae that attach to fish, and now with the fish, they, they, they don't always go up downstream, but they always go sometimes upstream, and then these are the fish, these are then the mussels that survive, right, because it's still fresh water. So that's why this is a completely freshwater group. These all these 900 plus species. The ones that you find in estuaries. Uh, so when we're talking about brackish water, this is very difficult physiologically to survive, right? Because you have these differences in salinity. Sometimes it's fresh water and it's very low salinity, and sometimes quite high. So as far, I'm not an expert in estuarine species, but um, what, what you end up with is very few species who can live there, so you have very low diversity usually in, in, in estuarine, brackish systems, um, but very high, high density. That's why, I don't know, we call them lokan, I'm not sure what the word is for, for here. Uh, for, for They sell them in stalls quite a lot, so sometimes, oh yeah, so it's sunga sunga, right? Eh? But it's not, it's brackish, so <laughs> it's not what I want. <laughs> but they are often sold in the stalls because I think it, it, you can get it, because they're so abundant there. It's all one species, it's not a mix of species, but you can, can find a lot. Because that species somehow managed to adapt physiologically to be what, first, like a very low salinity as well, and high salinity is always changing, they, they may, but not many species have man, managed it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Miss. Um, so, thank you very much to answer my curiosity. Maybe after this, I will learning and searching uh, more about the selfies. Thank you <laughs> yeah, very much. Yeah, great, yeah. And, and you don't need to become excited about muscles or anything. I just want you to yeah, realize how important each of you is. Uh, you can really make, like, have very, very, very big impact, whatever you do in terms of conservation, ecology, um, yeah, or even in, in man, as you say, you talked yesterday about management of, of uh, agriculture, a forest, that's so impactful for so many things and it's really, really important and yeah, I'm so glad that this new generation is taking these things seriously. Rosinta, <laughs> I'm an undergraduate and I'm on my fifth semester. So, Professor Sandy, I have a question. So, what I saw, you saw the picture that at first, there is a lot of endemic species, but then it was overruled by the alien species. Yeah. Ah, yes, that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. But also, the ones that you found on oh, Borneo, the closest relative, it's from Thailand. So I was wondering if there is a chance that one day these species can overrule the other endemic species. Because our worry here, the alien species will become invasive such as Professor Hale has mentioned, the crayfish is quite an invasive species. I haven't heard about mussels that became invasive species, but let's not close the chances for that to become. That is my question. Thank you very much. Yes, that's, that's a good question. So, uh, first of all, this uh, image here does not show my whole data. It's what we call, for this journal, I had to produce a graphical abstract, which summarizes the most important point of your paper. So this is a really simplified uh, description of what we're showing, and it only shows, uh, it doesn't show all of the species. We had, what, like 10 species here, and here only showing four. And this shows, you know, this is the historical data of these rare species, um, just for these, these four species. And then it just shows you that these, uh, these have become really rare. We only found these two species at one site each. A third species we could not find at all. And then we have lots of record of these invasive species. So, so there's much more data to that paper, but this is just showing the extremes on both sides, right? Um, this species is the same one as this one. It's all one. We have one non-native species of freshwater bivalves from the same order, which is this Kijing Taiwan. The reason why it can spread so easily in anthropogenic habitats is, first of all, it uses carp and especially tilapia as a fish host. So they're being brought in, tilapias being stocked somewhere in ponds or in a river, and then those people say, oh yeah, we have lots of mussels here. Oh yeah, because they came infested with this Kijing Taiwan, they drop off. And, and the other thing is they can live in very eutrophic, polluted 
uh, habitat. So the first record actually for this one is from a golf course pond, like in a golf, <laughs> in a golf, yeah, area. They can live in in fish ponds, like really, or your trophy. Uh, it's really disgusting when you go find it. Uh, very very nutrient rich, whereas all the other species they can't really deal with it. Sometimes we find this non-native species with a native species together in streams. So they have a very broad ecological niche. They can also live in good conditions, but I presume they're not as um, competitive in these conditions. So the issue with invasive species is to prove, was it the invasive species that has uh, um, competed against the non-native species, and that's why the non-native species has uh, declined or has, uh, has become ex extirpated in that um, site, or is it that, and, and this is why then the habitat condition changed and this runs like in parallel, or is it the habitat condition have changed because of other changes to the habitat, and that's why only the non-native species can live there. So basically, do we put the blame on the non-native species or not? And in some, that's really difficult to test and to prove. Um, there have been studies on a related species from the same genus, which is very similar ecologically. We've thought for a long time it's the same species, um, where they showed that this, this non-native species, uh, once they have infested a host, it can't be used by the native species anymore. So there's true competition in that sense. Um, yeah, we have no idea what it is for, for this one. So that's, I mean, it's difficult to say, is it, is it their fault or not? Uh, it doesn't really matter um, because it, I, in my, my opinion, the, the biggest threat is the habitat change. Um, but yes, when you change the habitat, so when you go from a nice forest stream to a river where you have the palms, oil palm, um, planted right at the edge, you get all the sedimentation, you get lots of uh, pollution in there, organic pollution, and then somehow this non-native species is being introduced there, it will replace the native ones for sure, yeah. And, and so we have projected this in this modeling paper where we show that the suitability for this non-native species in comparison to the native species, the habitat suitability is will be much bigger um, in, you know, by 2050. It also can withstand much higher temperatures, so climate change plus the change in, in riparian vegetation, all that affects that. So it, it could happen, um, yeah. <laughs> I also want to mention about the caudalitis that you found. I remember around a decade before, that is quite abundant on the riverside close to my home that is on Diane Hillier. So maybe if you want to study more about those species. Which maybe one? The Caudelatus one. The, this one? You yep, mean? the Caudelatus. This one? Yeah. Yes, so I wonder, yeah, so this looks quite similar to this non-native species. Uh, but yes, it's great. It's, it's really difficult actually. You need to hold it in comparison to some other species because um, uh, it looks similar, like some pseudodonus as well. But uh, if you think that it was really, what type of habitat was it? Uh, it's a river, but next to it there's a old palm tree plantations. Okay. But it was owned by the locals, so it's not really like yeah. thousands of acres, only a few acres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Great, yeah. So if anybody has data like this, this is really, really helpful for us because we are hoping to get a grant to go uh, further to, towards east. Uh, and yeah, and we're always looking for field assistance as well. So if anybody is interested in joining such a trip, uh, yeah, reach out to, to me, please. Um, because this is a big thing for us. Uh, the knowledge transfer. So it's great if we can get obviously Pakari, but we're profiting more from you than you from us because you're very busy with your actual, <laughs> your own research. But even better is if we can get students involved um, yeah. and, and, and trained. And it's not, I don't say you are signing up, you have to work on freshwater muscles, but you get the experience and you can then show it to your friends. And, and that is where we need to, uh, I think, start 
And it's great that you have this, you know, long-term collaboration with, with Unimas as well, um, sharing the teaching and, and, and all that. that that That's so important, I think. Ah, yeah. So I'll, I'll catch you up on, on that site. Yeah, Thank that's you really very much. Anybody much. else who has um, muscle record? Do you call them Kiching here or what do you call them? Because they, they have different names everywhere we go, but do you call them Kiching here in this area? From my area, we call it kapa. Kapa. Yeah. Uh huh. Kapa. But it's not breakish. No, it's not breakish. Okay. Sure, it's also okay. Yeah. Or uh, we don't have no more time. Maybe we can close the session. Uh, thank you for uh, Prof. Hyrule and then Mrs. Alexander to sharing us to a very high experience uh, and research, a good experience and good research for us. And um, thank you for uh, Mr. Prof. Jen to join us with this session and then uh, thank you for uh, Mr. Hardy to join us and another uh, student in here, I th very thank you. And then uh, we can come back to, maybe I can, and, yeah. Uh, Pak Yan, thank you for uh, joining with us today. Uh, kita beri applause dulu untuk Ibu Sandi, Pak Ayu. Uh, we, uh, we have souvenir for you, oh, please come forward. Uh, yeah, 